Hello and welcome back to Project Phobocam. Well, we're finally here. We've reached the end of my project. What I want to talk to you about today is principally about results and what this all means for the overarching aim of my project, which just to remind you was to design a thermal infrared instrument that could be used for landing site selection on a future sample return mission to the moons of Mars, which primarily is to be done in order to try and understand how the moons of Mars formed, which has deep implications for planetary formation as a whole, and even potentially things like the origin of life. It's a very important and scientific question to be answered. So anyway, let me just talk about uh, kind of how this all works in Oxford. So during February and March of 2015, that was when I carried out much of the primary laboratory work of my project. It's now May 2015 and what I had to do following my project was a write-up based on the science I conducted, all the results, the resulting analysis and presenting my conclusions. And this formed the basis of my master's thesis for my degree, which is here. I'm very, I'm very, very pleased with this. So in total, it's about say seven thousand words or so, fourteen pages. Um, and so yeah, so this has already been submitted. It's being assessed at the moment, and in a couple of weeks' time or so, I'll have what's called a viva, where I will be meeting the two people assessing my project, which is worth roughly fifteen percent of my degree, just basically so that we can clear up any misunderstandings they might have about anything I've written in my project report. Um, also, so they can get a deeper understanding of what I actually did carrying out my analysis for my project. So that will be coming up shortly, and also. So um, around June time, so just, um, well, scary enough, just about five weeks or so from now, I'll be having my final university exams in astrophysics and theoretical physics. This will then all combine together and then in July I will finally be graduating from Oxford University. Now I'm very pleased to say with regards to what's coming next that following my various PhD interviews around the country earlier in this year, I have been accepted on a PhD place at the University of Cambridge where I'll be starting in October at the Institute of Astronomy. Principally the research that I'll be carrying out for my PhD there will be focused on exoplanets, exoplanetary systems, trying to really understand what makes exoplanets tick, what their atmospheres are made of, and even maybe potentially in the long term working more towards understanding what it means for an exoplanet to be habitable. So I'm very, very excited about this. But anyway, back to my project. So just to remind you, what I've done up to this point is I created a sample of analog Phobos regolith, basically what we expect the surface material of Phobos and potentially even Deimos, the other of the moons of Mars, to be made of. So once I obtained this sample, I measured it under simulated Phobos conditions in the thermal infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is between 8 and 25 micrometers. This is basically to generate a predicted spectrum of what we expect an idealized orbiter around Phobos would see. Now, of course, there's no such thing as an idealized orbiter. It will have limited resolution compared to what we can do in the laboratory. But that's the key. Once I know what this spectrum would look like ideally, I can then pick out the most prominent features and say, right, the actual spacecraft needs to be able to look here, here, here and here. And the resolution, something mathematically we call the signal to noise ratio, has to be greater than this certain value. I then analyze, based on these constraints on the instrument, what you require to actually pull it off. So I'll be looking at various different instruments which have already flown on various space missions, adapting them so that they suit the specific scientific objectives for a sample return mission to Phobos, and overall presenting my design. So what is a thermal infrared emission measurement? So here I've plotted the thermal emission from a surface as a function of wavelength for three different temperatures, 350 Kelvin, 300 Kelvin and 250 Kelvin. Now what I'm showing in these plots is effectively the power or energy per unit time that our detector would receive from a surface that it's looking at. Now what I'd like to note about these curves is that as a surface gets hotter it puts out more energy at every single wavelength and also the peak, the location where the most energy is being put out, gradually shifts to smaller wavelengths.
Now I've shaded in the region called the thermal infrared, which is between 8 and 25 micrometers. And the reason why this is called the thermal infrared is because the peak of the emission from surfaces lies within this region for typical surface temperatures we see in the solar system. So the blue curve at 300 Kelvin is the one that is closest representative of Phobos. And you can see that it peaks around 9 micrometers or so. But what you have to notice is that these are just ideal curves. They're what a perfect emitter would put out. But of course, nothing in the universe is a perfect emitter. I mean, the sun comes pretty close to one of these curves, and the most idealized one would be the cosmic microwave background. But a real surface will put out less energy than these, and crucially, the energy that it puts out at each wavelength will vary depending on the specific minerals. So let's take a look at what a real emission spectrum was. So here, if you take a look, I focused on the blue curve, the 300 Kelvin one. But what I've plotted in green here is the actual emission that we've measured here in Oxford from a carbonaceous chondrite meteorite, which is a very similar composition to what we might see on Phobos. Now, I'm not able to show here my real results from my desiccated nonchonite because we might be publishing that at some point. But this is, for our purposes, is very similar. Now, what you can notice here is that there are certain wavelengths, notably around 11 or 12 micrometers, where there is significantly less emission at those wavelengths than you might expect from an idealized black body curve. And this is due to the specific atomic structure, actually due to the quantum mechanics of the atoms and molecular bonds that make up the substance. Mathematically, this is represented by the actual emission being given by the idealized emission from the black body curve, which is represented by the function b, no idea why, it, why it's called b, which I've given on the left there, multiplied by something called the spectral emissivity which is a function that varies between 0 and 1 because you can never put out more energy than a perfect emitter. Now, the closer that this is to 0 at a certain wavelength, the stronger the absorption feature. Now, if we want to be able to tell by looking at a surface from its thermal emission what it's made of, we can put certain bands at certain wavelengths where these absorption features are strongest, and that is our best hope to be able to characterize the surface. But, I mean, it's not immediately obvious from looking at this plot which are the strongest features. In order to do that, what you do, and this is what is actually done in our moon box, is you take the actual emission and you divide out the black body emission, which comes from a calibration target, and that will give you a plot of the actual spectral emissivity itself. So let's take a look at what this actually looks like for an example mineral. In this case, for the mineral Labradorite, the reason why I chose to show you this mineral is because it's already been seen on Mars, so we know it's present in the Martian system, and also the size of the particles that were measured here was between 0 and 25 micrometers, so it corresponds quite nicely with the simulated Phobos regolith which I prepared. Now, what I really want to point out here is how much the emissivity spectrum changes depending on the specific conditions you measure it under. The blue curve is showing what it would look like if you just naively measured it under Earth-like conditions, namely one atmosphere and about 300 Kelvin for the temperature. But as you gradually pump out the atmosphere, going down from a half vacuum down to a vacuum, the features change completely. In particular, one of the most prominent features at 12 micrometers in the Earth-like spectrum, which is called the transparency feature, denoted here by TF, completely disappears when measuring it under vacuum conditions. It's also important to simulate the right temperature environment, heating your samples from above and below, to replicate what you would see actually on the terrestrial body you're interested in studying. Here, it was done under lunar conditions, but it's exactly the same principle for Phobos conditions. So naively, you might put a band on your instrument at 12 micrometers to spot the transparency feature if you wanted to detect labradorite. But when you would actually get your spacecraft there, it would not see that feature because when you measure it under simulated conditions, it is not there. That's why it's so important to obtain these spectra under simulated conditions and why I went through such pain in my project to create a simulated Phobos environment for carrying out these measurements. So instead, if you wanted to detect this mineral, a good thing to do would be to look at the location of the maximum in this spectra, which is called the Christiansen feature and denoted by CF, because the position of the Christiansen feature is very diagnostic of composition. It shifts around a bit depending on the bond strength of the mineral you're looking at and on the specific molecular geometry.
Another good thing to look at is the location of these small little minima called the restralum bands, which are denoted by Rb in here, because this again depends on the specific quantum mechanics of interactions with bonds, it depends on the molecular vibration bands in silicon oxygen bonds, which are present in practically all silicon minerals. So just by looking at this, I would say a good location for a band to spot this mineral would be say 9 micrometers and 10 micrometers, looking at the two little minima to the left and right of that little bump that seems to be around say 9 or 9.5 micrometers and maybe a few bands at say 16 or 17 micrometers looking at the second set of RB bands. So now that we've got a handle on what we expect some potential thermal infrared spectra to look like, it's now time to investigate instrument design that we could use to differentiate between different compositions. Now one thing I will note at the beginning is you could fly something called a thermal infrared spectrometer to Phobos which would produce something very similar to the spectrum that we've just seen. It would map out the entire thing but it has a quite low resolution. Instead a more sensible thing to do if you already know a priori where you expect to see certain features which luckily enough we do from these measurements it's better to send an instrument called a filter radiometer which looks in a number of different spectral bands, little tiny spectral windows but with very high resolution. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on. So firstly I want to talk about some existing hardware. The first one is there was a mission that went to Mars called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, still there today, incredibly successful mission, and one of the payloads on board it was called the Mars Climate Sounder, principally used for understanding the atmosphere of Mars. A photograph of the Mars Climate Sounder is shown there on the left. Principally, its science objectives was to map out the temperature distribution of Mars's atmosphere as a function of altitude, and also to study how the presence of dust and also water vapour alters the spectral properties of the Martian atmosphere. This flew on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter in 2005 and also if you look on the right you'll see it looks strikingly similar to a different filter radiometer which flew on board the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter in 2009. This instrument was called Diviner. Now Diviner had a different scientific goal in terms of it was mapping out mineralogy of the surface of the moon, it was also looking at temperature distributions on the moon. I mean back then that was of course before NASA's constellation program was cancelled and Diviner was designed as a precursor mission for mapping out potential areas of resources on the moon, maybe for future bases. But it's still on there, valiantly orbiting around the moon, pursuing its science objectives. So what I wanted to demonstrate here is that the same instrument architecture can be used for different science objectives. Instead what you do is you alter the actual spectral bands inside of the telescopes. So you'll notice that Diviner and the Mars Climate Sounder have two telescopes, one on the left which is telescope A and one on the right which is telescope B. Now for these particular telescopes what they chose was to have the longer wavelength bands in the telescope on the right, telescope B, focusing on wavelengths outside of the thermal infrared greater than 25 micrometers and there were three bands in telescope B, whilst telescope A would have six bands now I've chosen to modify this slightly since I'm only interested in the thermal infrared and instead I've crammed actually six spectral bands into telescope B and six into telescope A giving us 12 bands in total to work from. So okay now it's time to show you my overall instrument design which is based on this overall architecture. Here I'm pleased to present to you the Phobos infrared emission radiometer specifications or the finder instrument. So you'll notice that I've actually offered two different potential configurations, what I've called Finder M+, which focuses specifically on in-depth mineralogical classification of the surface, and the T plus configuration, which focuses on temperature mapping of the surface, very similar to what Diviner was oriented to. You'll notice that there are three C bands, which are for mapping the location of the Christiansen feature, which to remind you was vital for establishing mineralogy. And then there's also a number of different mineral bands as well, and I've given the locations for all of these at the bottom there, in terms of their locations in micrometers. And then the T bands are for, as mentioned, mapping the temperature, which is designed in order to establish the thermal inertia distribution of the surface, so that you can select the landing sites that are compatible with your various sampling mechanisms, and avoid, say, bouldery regions, and select a much nicer to land in, very fine powder region. The table on the right gives the key parameters of my instrument design. Probably the most important ones to see there is the field of view. 
During the mapping phase of Phobos, during the sample return mission, it will orbit in what's called a quasi-satellite orbit, uh, what's noted there by QSO, at an altitude of 60 kilometers, giving it a region that it can see on the surface that goes about 400 meters by 200 meters. Now, that may not sound particularly precise, but that's just used to draw up a short list of landing site locations. You then do a number of close flybys with an altitude of three kilometers, which gets you much more precise down to 20 meters by 10 meters. And you can get even more precise when you actually have chosen your landing site by hovering above the surface, subtly firing your engines, because Phobos has really, really low surface gravity. But the really key parameter to establish that this instrument would actually be able to accomplish its scientific goals is what's called the signal to noise ratio, which I've given an equation for down at the bottom. Based on my own observations of the non tonite sample which I created, my analog Phobos regolith, which was used to select the locations of the mineralogy bands, I concluded that in order to be able to definitively resolve these features, you have to have a signal to noise ratio greater than about 350. And I'm pleased to say that based on my overall architecture and the design as I presented it here, the signal to noise ratio of Finder would be 525. So this would indeed be able to meet our science objectives and select a landing site on Phobos that has the minerals we need to definitively solve the issue of the formation of Phobos. Now one thing that I haven't really had the chance to talk about is the actual science of Phobos formation theories, the history of observations about Phobos, the various missions we've sent to it over the years, our current state-of-the-art understanding about the moons of Mars, and also about the specific architecture and design of the sample return mission itself beyond just landing site selection. Now I haven't neglected this, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to be making a supplementary video which I'm going to be releasing next week because I just wouldn't be able to do it just this. this is a very complex field just with the time constraints that I have here. So keep an eye out next week because I'm really excited to be going into the specifics of how the sample return mission will work. It's a joint European-Russian mission which I'm modelling this on which was studied in detail last year and really just seem to be moving ahead at the moment actually. It's based on something called Project Footprint. Very, There's very little information about it in the public domain at the moment so I'm very excited to be able to share some of this information with you. Well here we are the end of Project Phobocam. I hope you enjoyed this insight into what master's level research in the planetary sciences is like and the kind of ups and downs that comes from doing real research. By all means please let me know in the comments down below what you thought about the series and keep an eye out next week for the bonus material on Phobos sample formation and about Phobos sample return missions.